So hello everyone and thank you very much for joining our webinar today all about international organizations in the age of Trump, Brexit and the emerging powers. Um, we're just giving a few moments just to let everyone sign on to the webinar. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I'd like to introduce myself as Annie and I'll be your webinar host today. And I'm also joined by Dr. Heil K. Dextra, who will be leading the discussion today. So just a few things to note before we get started. We should be taking about 45 minutes of your time today, including some time for a question and answer session at the end. You might be aware that there's a panel on the right hand side of your screen and you can use this to type questions in the chat box as and when they occur to you during the webinar. We can address these throughout and save some from the Q&A at the end. At the moment, you're all on mute because the audio feedback can sometimes affect the quality of the sound. Therefore, if you'd like to ask questions during the webinar, just make sure to type them up in the panel and we'll look at those as we go through. We're also making a recording of this webinar, so we'll be able to share this with you afterwards so you can watch it again or share it with any colleagues who might be interested. So moving on to the agenda for the webinar, today we're looking at the role of international organisations in the current climate. So firstly, we'll discuss their importance, how they're established and how they function, and then we'll look at the policies they're creating and their impact. And finally, we'll dedicate some time to teaching courses on international organisations, the different approaches and resources available. And we'll wrap up with a dedicated question and answer session at the end. Please do feel free to type up your questions as we go and we'll try and answer these throughout. So now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for today, Dr. Hal K. Dextra, Director of the MA in European Studies at Maastricht University and updating author for the third edition of a core text for students studying international organisations. So I'll let him introduce himself now and I'll hand over to him to begin the discussion. Good afternoon and um, welcome from um, Brussels uh, where I'm currently uh, at. This, I must say, is my very first webinar, um, the first time that I'm doing this. So I'm very curious uh, about the experience. Um, I'm also very eager um, to uh, learn all about your, your questions, so please do ask them um, during the presentation um, and we can um, you know, take it slowly across the slides um, so that we have enough time for questions um, and, and I'll pause um, a bit to make sure that, that everybody can provide their um, input. Um, over the last um, say year or so, two years actually, um, we've been working very hard on the third edition um, of our new textbook, International Organizations, um, and I've taken the lead um, in the revisions for this book. Um, we're very happy that this book is now um, finally out. It was published um, late um, January um, and should be now in, in all the sorts of bookstores. Uh, but just rather than only talking about um, the book today, um, I want to talk about um, international organization more broadly. Um, where do we stand and um, how can we understand them um, and, and what about um, the Trump administration um, the Brexit vote which we obviously had in, in Parliament yesterday and the challenge of the BRICS um, and so forth. Um, so my intention is to um, give a broader presentation on international organizations um, in the beginning of this webinar um, and then towards the end um, we can talk a bit more about um, what the book is precisely about, how you can use the book um, in teaching um, in your courses um, and so forth. Um, so if I can have the next slide, um, we can start with um, um, you know, why international organizations. Um, and what I present here on the slide um, is the very first figure, um, I think it's on, chap on page two or so of the, of the book, um, which maps um, the enormous growth of international organizations over the last two centuries. Um, and it's really quite an impressive number um, we currently have. Um, 330 or so international organizations. We're talking here about formal international organizations like the United Nations, European Union, World Trade Organization, and so forth. Um, and you see a rather dramatic um, increase over time, particularly since the end of the, the Second um, World War. Um, so I think this is the situation we're currently facing. All major problems on the international stage um, require the involvement of some sort of international organization. Um, and I think that also really justifies 
um, talking about this, um, teaching about it, um, and, and thinking about you know where where do we currently stand? Um, what's important um, in this figure um, is not just um, I think the dramatic growth, um, particularly since the end of the Second World War, as I said, um, but also the development of the last 25 years or so. Um, you see in the top right of the graph um, that the growth has slowed down. Um, this is actually development that has continued um, since 2005, since uh, where, where this figure um, ends. Um, currently, the number of international organizations is not growing anymore. Um, some new ones are still created, but, but other ones die um, as well. Um, and I think that really brings us to the discussion of today um, and, and my next um, slide, if I can have it, please. Um, despite this enormous uh, growth of international organizations and despite all the talk about the, the liberal world order um, after the end of the Cold War, what we currently see is that um, almost every single international organization we can think of is currently under pressure. Um, I've put a number of logos here on the slide and I think it's worth going through um, some of them to really talk about you know, the type of uh, pressures that they're facing. Um, UNESCO, as you may know, um, lost uh, the United States and Israel as a donor in 2011. The United States decided no longer to contribute to the UNESCO budget. And in the Trump administration, um, the United States has left UNESCO for the second time in history, um, end of last year. Um, International Criminal Court, a very different organization in The Hague, um, has lost Burundi um, as a member state and is currently in the process of losing the Philippines. Um, so an organization that uh, presumably deals with universal um, values um, is now losing member states which are not happy with the investigations that it's carrying out. Um, we have NATO, um, which is obviously under uh, pressure of the Trump administration. Donald Trump refused to endorse Article 5 during the Brussels summit. Um, he, um, New York Times reported earlier this year that, that Trump privately thought that it was time for the United States to leave NATO. Um, so once again, an organization um, there where the cornerstone Article 5, um, the article that, that guarantees collective defense is actually under pressure. World Trade Organization, um, I think, is another wonderful example here. Um, has been one of the most successful international organizations um, since it was um, created in the post-Cold War era. Um, tremendous driver for economic growth, for instance, in China. Um, and yet we're currently in a situation where in the US-Chinese um, trade dispute, the, the World Trade Organization stands on the sidelines. Um, the other trouble with the World Trade Organization is currently that the Trump administration refuses to appoint uh, judges to the appellate body, so there are only three judges left. I'm currently in the appellate body of the World Trade Organization, which essentially paralyzes this organization. Um, and then finally, to, to get to the European Union, um, well, you know, Britain is leaving. We've seen the vote yesterday. Um, there will be a vote today. There might be a vote tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen in the next two weeks. But I think it's clear um, that we see pressures here as well. Um, so I think five. Uh, international organizations, household names, if you like, the type of international organizations we read about um, in the newspapers um, that, that are facing significant pressures in, in the current um, uh, global order. Um, and I think this, this also warrants more attention to the study of international organizations and really understand what is going on um, there um, and, and how will we move forward. Um, so I think that's um, really the, the introduction of my talk today. We've seen an enormous increase in international organizations that makes international organizations worth studying. Um, at the same time, currently, we see um, a lot of pressure um, of international organizations, um, which makes it even more important that we actually understand um, you know, what these organizations contribute, um, how they function, um, and, and whether it's worth keeping them around. Um, so that's really for me the starting point, um, and that brings me um, to our first quiz question um, for you. Um, I think it's on the next slide. Um, the question here is, and I would like you to um, answer it via um, a poll that you will see appearing quite quickly. Um, how deep does the current crisis of international organizations run? So the first question, the first option is, um, this is a temporary crisis, mostly related to Trump administration. 
Um, the second option is, this is a shake-up of global governance as we know it, um, but ultimately international organizations will survive. Um, the third one is, this is the beginning of the end of Western liberal order. Um, so really, you know, we're going to see something else. Um, obviously, there's the, the option, not sure. Um, so if I could just please ask you to fill out this poll. Um, I have absolutely no idea what the result will be. So I, it's also very exciting for me um, to see this. Um, I, I think that would be good. Okay, so we have here the results. Um, almost unanimously, everybody um, says that it's a shake-up of, of global governance, but IOs will survive. Um, so nobody thinks this is really a temporary issue related to the Trump administration, um, and nobody um, really thinks that this is the end of um, Western liberal order as, as we know it. Um, I would say that that's perhaps slightly comforting, um, you know, sitting here in, in Europe um, and generally thinking that, you know, global governance is, is a good thing for us. Um, at the same time, I think it also shows that um, um, more is needed from and required from international organizations and it goes beyond the, the election of one U.S. president. So thank you very much for filling out that poll. Um, I would then like to move forward um, with some of the key questions that were raised um, um, in the agenda. Um, the three questions are, um, how are international organizations established, um, how do they function, and what type of policies do they produce? So I'm going to be running through these three big questions um, uh, now um, during this webinar, and I think that's really the, the substance as well um, of our book. Um, so in the book, we restart with the question, how are international organizations established? Um, and we discussed this theoretically, we discussed this hi historically, um, but I think the interesting bit for today is as well um, that the type of argument we're making in the book um, also has relevance to understanding um, the current climate uh, and the current challenges of international organizations. Um, so I first would like to go a bit back to how international organizations are established and then secondly, um, I want to talk a bit about, you know, how can we use this to understand the current crisis. Um, so, in the book, we identify three conditions um, how international organizations are established. Um, and roughly, you could say that they relate to um, liberal, um, constructivist, um, and realist type of explanations of international organizations. So, for us, the starting point really is that there needs to be a problem, which we call the problem condition. There needs to be a, a transnational, international problem uh, between countries. Um, that countries would like to, to solve. Um, interesting example is the Rhine River Commission, one of the first international organizations created in the 19th century. Um, as commerce on the Rhine River increased, there were all kind of navigation challenges um, and the countries around the River Rhine decided to harmonize um, this by creating an international organization to address some of these navigation challenges. Um, so a problem really occurred um, on the international agenda, uh, increased um, traffic because of international commerce on the Rhine, um, and they thought that uh, an international organization could solve this. Um, another example is um, we identified that there is a gap in the ozone layer um, during the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so how are we going to address that um, for international cooperation in the form of an international organization? So international organizations, first and foremost, are really established um, to solve problems. So a very functional argument um, underlining the creation of international organizations. Um, what we say, however, in the book, and I think that's important, is it's not just that the problem should be there, um, there should also be a perception or understanding on the side of political actors that an international organization can indeed effectively address um, this problem. Um, and that's largely, you know, a perception question. Um, so do relevant actors believe that an international organization is the most effective way of addressing um, a problem? Um, and I think that already, already raises a number of points. Um, many international organizations believe or we 
at least perceive, um, are not necessarily very effective in, in solving problems. Um, and I think a big challenge to international organizations today is indeed the question, you know, international organizations have been around for a while, they haven't necessarily solved the problems. Should we reform them? Should we try alternative forms of governance? Or should we um, uh, close down international organizations? So I think particularly in the current debate, the, the, the cognitive condition, um, whether we think that international organizations are the solution to our problems um, is particularly important. Um, what's also very relevant here um, is that international cooperation carries some cooperation costs. Um, I think this is pretty well um, known in the, in the literature. Uh, cooperation can break down because of second, um, second order um, effects, you can have free riders, um, there can be non-compliance um, and so forth. Um, and I think it's quite established in the academic literature that to address these costs um, is, is really quite a bit of a challenge um, and it helps if there's a strong member state, a strong hegemon um, around willing to carry some of these cooperation costs because they know that the overall benefits of cooperation are far greater um, than the smaller type of cooperation costs. Um, and obviously we're here in a situation where um, a lot of international organizations have long benefited from the involvement of the United States. Um, the United States might have been you know, critical of international organizations. Um, it, you know, its support for international organizations has changed from administration to administration. Um, but I think on the whole, um, for most international organizations, there was significant support from the United States, and this has helped to sustain um, international cooperation. Um, now, that obviously, that situation obviously changing. We don't know what comes after the, the Trump administration, um, but there is a bit of a discussion um, more generally in international relations that we're moving away from unipolarity to more complex international um, order, and this will also likely um, affect international organization. I think that's partly what we're currently um, seeing today. Um, so these three conditions um, which help us to explain the rise uh, and development of international organizations in the book, um, I think are also very useful um, in understanding um, the current situation and current challenges on, on international organizations. Um, so that's really the first um, you know, main topic I want to talk about, you know, how are international organizations established? Um, before moving on to the next one, which is about how do they function, um, I'm just going to take a couple of seconds to pause here in case there are any questions. Um, are there any questions so far? Uh, no questions at the moment. Okay, then I suggest we move on to the next slide. Um, if there's still questions on this one, uh, please feel free to, to ask them. Um, and we can return to this slide uh, whenever that's, uh, that's needed. So if I can just have the next slide. Um, so for me, after the creation, the big question is, you know, how do international organizations function? Um, and I think this is really what makes this, um, this book different from other approaches to international organizations. Um, the core bit of the book is that we really approach international organizations through um, a political systems perspective. Um, so we see international organizations as a political system. Um, we discuss the different bits of the political system. We discuss how this works out um, in all kinds of policy areas. Um, and I think it's a very elegant uh, and straightforward um, tool um, to understand the real functioning of international organizations. So political systems approach um, has been used in political science, um, has also been applied notably by Simon Hicks to the, to the European Union. So that's the other um, the big textbook. Um, and we use it here um, to understand international organizations. Um, so essentially there are three big elements um, in uh, this approach. Um, political actors provide input for international organizations. International organizations then convert uh, that input um, into output. Um, in terms of input, you can think about um, political demands, um, preferences, um, you know, statements by political actors, mostly member states, uh, but you can also think here about um, NGOs, uh, experts, uh, multinational um, companies. So different political actors provide demands um, to international organizations. They can also provide support, um, for instance, you know, backing up international organizations by statements, 
um, paying for um, international organizations through um, financial resources, um, sending qualified staff to international organizations um, to help them out. Um, so international organizations are subject to a whole range of, of inputs by political actors. Um, now what international organizations produce is output. Um, this includes decisions, um, you know, statements. The UN Security Council adopts a resolution, um, for instance, which says A, B, and C. Um, but it also um, produces output in the form of activities. Um, so the UN Security Council might mandate a UN peacekeeping operation, um, which is then implemented under the authority of the UN. So I think that's a, that's a clear activity. Um, now, I think the interesting bit about the political systems approach um, is that there is a strong institutional argument here. Um, so we argue in the book that um, different international organizations will convert the same input uh, into different outputs. Um, so what matters for us is how international organizations are organized um, in terms of institutions, in terms of its treaties, in terms of the uh, institutional structure. Uh, they have the, um, the assembly of member states, the international secretariat, the staff working for international organizations, the amount of access that's granted to other, other actors and so forth. So different international organizations can convert the same input um, into different outputs. Um, and I think it's indeed quite striking if you look at um, the different chapters in our book addressing the different policy domains and um, that the dynamics across policy domains, whether we talk about peace and security or the environment, um, are very different in terms of the types of political actors that provide input and um, the type of rules by which international organizations convert that input um, and also the sorts of outputs um, that international organizations produce. Um, so it's it's really quite a you know straightforward um, simple way of understanding um, how across different uh, policy domains um, policy is made by by international organizations. Um, and in the, the, the middle of the book we you know we have a chapter on input, we have a chapter on conversion, we have a chapter on output. Um, I'm happy to talk a bit further about um, the details here, but I think this also helps us to understand, uh, you know, how international organizations get um, under pressure. For instance, you can think about output um, and you can think about the degree of f effectiveness. Um, so if the UN Security Council mandates a, a peacekeeping operation um, in Mali or a Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and if that peacekeeping operation um, so that, that's launched, that affects the, the political and security situation in, in Mali uh, or Congo. So that's what we call the international environment. Um, but the question really here is, are these peacekeeping operations effective? Do they achieve their mandates? Um, and um, if not, um, that provides once again input for political actors to perhaps readjust um, these kind of operations close down these operations, expand the mandate of those peacekeeping operations. And um, so we see a real loop here. Um, and I think this is particularly important when thinking about some of the negative pressures here. Um, for instance, some of the output that international organizations produce might not be perceived um, as effective. Um, so this can you know, result in a situation where international or where, where member states of international organizations increase their demands, but also clearly withdraw their, their support. Um, take away the financing, um, start blocking um, you know, appointment of judges to the, to the uh, World um, Trade Organization um, and so forth. Um, what perhaps this approach doesn't do is um, it, it doesn't show why member states effectively walk away from international organizations. So it's really about you know, changing inputs, um, um, changing supports, um, really quitting international organizations. Um, I think it would be, you know, as a more extreme step, it's not the step that happens on an everyday basis. Um, but then again, we have to go back to some of these conditions discussed on the previous um, slide uh, about the establishment of international organization, and ultimately also um, the broader pressures of, of international organization.
Um, so for us, this is really the, the model which we use. We use it throughout the book um, from introduction to, to conclusion um, to really provide a clear concept um, of how international organizations uh, work on an everyday basis, how they make policy, um, how they uh, address conflicting preferences by political actors, um, how the specific rules of international organizations um, affect how input um, is converted in output. And so this is really for us at the heart of, of the book. Um, once again, I'm just going to take a couple of seconds um, before moving on to the next um, slide. Um, and I can already say that the um, next uh, couple of slides, I'm going to be talking about um, what, what international organizations produce, the effectiveness of international organizations. Uh, but we first have a poll question uh, for you first. So perhaps you could bring that up, that poll question. Uh, yeah, um, we've had some questions come in just uh, while you've been discussing that last slide. So shall I pose those to you now? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Um, so the first one is, um, do you make a difference between strategy orientated international organizations, so the UN and the Red Cross, versus specialized agencies such as the ITU, WMO, IOM, etc.? Um, yeah, no, I think that's a very good, um, very good question, um, and I think we address that head on um, in the introduction of our book. Um, so I gave on the first slide, I gave an overview of the, of the 300 international organizations or so that, that are around. Um, but I think we quite clearly recognize that, um, you know, international organizations themselves um, differ uh, very significantly as well. Um, I, I think in the book I included um, uh, the comparison of, uh, of apples and oranges. Um, you know, they're both round and they're both of the same size. Um, and yet the color, texture and taste is, is very different. Um, and I think this also goes for, um, for international organizations. Uh, a number of the organizations you mentioned, they differ very significantly as well. Um, so what we do is we provide three different typologies um, in our introductory um, chapter on how you can conceptualize international organizations. Um, and I think a very important one here um, is between the, the general purpose international organizations like the UN, the European Union, African Union, um, and more of the technical ones that deal with specific policy areas, for instance, um, um, the, uh, the Red Cross or the, um, um, the ITU was mentioned, but I think also the, the IMF. Um, another thing, distinction what we make um, is between those international organizations that mostly set rules um, and those international organizations that, that implement rules. Um, so in, in a number of cases that overlapped, um, as I said, the UN Security Council um, you know, set rules for its, its resolutions, but also partially implements those rules, for instance, through um, peacekeeping operations, um, uh, peace building operations and, and other things. Um, but you also have a number of international organizations that either really focus on setting setting the rules um, or only implementing it. Um, I think the, um, the development banks are a nice example of international organizations that have a very significant development budget um, and they use that to, to implement broader um, policies. Um, I think another nice example is the um, um, the um, IAEA, um, so that you know the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency um, that has a mandate to um, to verify part of the um, the non proliferation treaty. Um, so it hasn't really set the treaty itself. It hasn't set the non proliferation treaty, but it's it's got mandated to implement part um, part of it. Um, so that's another important distinction um, for us. Um, so I think that. That's really uh, an important starting point, um, and I think that also really speaks to the idea of the political systems. Um, that international organizations differ very dramatically in terms of you know who are the political actors, what are the rules, the institutionalization of the rules, um, and their sorts of output. Um, so in that sense, I think that the political systems approach provides um, you know, a nice general concept um, across the book, uh, a useful way to understand international organizations, but at the same time, it also allows us to, to show the variation uh, across international organizations. So thank you very much for that excellent question.
Okay, um, I'll ask one more and then I'll save a few for later on. Um, okay. So do you differentiate between internal, international organizations and bilateral ones? Okay. Um, yes, for us, um, we essentially exclude bilateral organizations. Um, an international organization is for us one with um, three or more member states. Um, so they're, they're essentially multilateral. Um, in that sense, we're, we're following the standard definitions of COHANE, but also um, the Correlate of War project and the data set by, by John Peefhaus on international organizations. Um, now, we realize very much by um, having a certain definition of international organizations, um, which we present as well in, in the introduction of our book, um, we exclude some um, at the expense of others. We also exclude other forms of global governance. Um, and I think these are the type of trade-offs um, we, we make in the book, uh, but I think these are also the try to type of questions that are worth discussing in class with students. Um, you, can may, you can provide a definition of international organizations, um, but what does that mean? Um, what does it mean that we focus mostly on formal organizations with um, state parties involved um, rather than informal uh, formations such as G20 um, or more private uh, actors, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and so forth. Um, so for me, um, this is not just about inclusion and exclusion. I think this is also really um, a, a nice type of discussion to, to have in class. Um, where are the boundaries and, and what do we mean by, by talking about the international organizations? Um, so I think that's an excellent point as well. Um, I think we should indeed move on to the to the next poll, um, and we can uh, follow up with with more questions um, later. Um, so, just a quick question for for all of you: um, In which policy area have international organisations been most effective? So, you can choose between peace and security, trade and development, the environment, and human rights. Um, I know it's not easy to um, answer it in such simple terms, but please take a moment and and pick the, the best policy field um, for you. Um, and then I have some data afterwards um, to, to discuss your answers. Okay, so we see a bit more variation um, than in the first poll. I think that's that's good to um, see. Um, so we have a bit on peace and security, um, with majority for trade and development, um, and a little bit in in human rights, um, none in the environment. Um, and I think it's interesting in the sense that this goes largely with. Um, a general understanding that international organizations are mostly active in the economic field uh, as opposed to the security field. Um, at the same time, I'm a bit surprised um, that, that nobody really pointed at um, the environment and, and human rights. I'm just wondering whether that's because of the, the current climate um, with climate change and, and the Trump administration uh, with regard to the environment. Um, but I think this is, an, is a nice starting point. Um, and I think the, the argument we pursue in the book across chapters um, is actually that it's quite difficult um, to point labels of effectiveness across policy domains and that it's very specific um, to certain uh, international organizations and, and the type of things you, you're looking at. So if I can have the next slide, please, um, I, I'll give some evidence of what I mean. Um, so this is um, a figure we have in the book and we've retried in, in every single policy chapter to put forward a very straightforward um, figure with some standard basic data um, for us to understand how, how cooperation and international organizations have been effective in, in the policy field. So here we see the number of armed conflicts um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, differentiated between colonial conflict, interstate conflicts, uh, and intrastate conflicts, so intrastate being civil wars. Um, and what we essentially see is that um, the type of traditional conflicts um, are rare. Um, so war between country A and country B um, is rare. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, the fact that we have a security council, um, the fact that we have constant dialogue, constant diplomacy has really helped 
um, to, to mitigate some of these um, wars between states. Um, at the same time, um, we see that civil war um, really does, hasn't gone down, um, probably even up um, a bit. Um, we see obviously a development um, from the, the early 1990s um, to mid 2000s. Um, but here the question is, um, you know, have things like UN peacekeepers um, and other security missions really helped us um, to address this problem? Uh, and, and the answer um, is if you just look at this, this um, graph, uh, probably not. Um, at the same time, there is very um, strong, increasingly strong uh, academic research uh, that peacekeeping operations um, have increased the duration of peace, uh, uh, peace agreements and uh, that they've reduced civilian casualties um, and, and so forth. Um, so I think the, the answer here is nuanced. Have international organizations created peace? Um, probably yes a bit, uh, but also um, no, um, and I think this is the, again the type of um, figures, the type of data we want to put forward um, to spark these type of um, discussions in class. Um, I want to move to the next slide um, uh, where we look at poverty. So the decrease of absolute poverty, the number of people living um, currently on 1.9 US dollars per day uh, decreased between early 80s um, and 2013 uh, across regions. Um, now, it's often said that the decrease of poverty is one of the most successful uh, of the, the original Millennium Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals currently. Um, but we also see tremendous uh, variation across regions. So while in East Asia and Pacific, mainly due um, to, um, to China and India, um, the, the number of people uh, in poverty has decreased very significantly. And we see that um, the results in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are a lot less um, impressive. Um, the question here also, once again, is, you know, is this the result of international organizations or is this indeed um, the result of proper economic management, uh, mostly in, in China? Um, so once again, um, these are the type of figures that, that open nice discussions for, for debate. Um, can I have another slide? And I think that's the final one on the effectiveness of international organizations um, and, and its human rights. Um, and what we've mapped here is the number of countries, um, according to the Freedom House, which are free, partially free or, or not free. Um, and I think this is, for me personally, one of the more worrying graphs is despite a very um, heavy institutionalization of, of human rights, um, not just at the universal level, but also certainly at the, at the European level, um, we have not seen um, really a lot of, of development here, um, particularly since the, the late 1990s. Um, so the, the real question once again is, um, you know, are international organizations making a dent here? Um, what do they contribute? Um, and, and so forth. Uh, but I think this is uh, the human rights chapter in this sense is, is one of our more worrying chapters in terms of effectiveness. Um, in all the other chapters, we see some degree of effectiveness. Um, here we see it um, less. Um, once again, you can wonder, you know, is this the type of data one should be looking at? Um, but I think it's, it provides an overall picture, which um, is once again a nice starting point for, for discussion. Um, so for me, these were the three real big questions that we tried to address in the book. Um, how are international organizations created? Um, how do they function? Um, and, and what type of policies do they produce? Um, what I would like to do now in the, the second bit of the, um, uh, the webinar, if you still uh, have uh, five to ten minutes to spare, is talk a bit about, you know, um, how can we use this book in, in the classroom? So if I can have the next slide, um, please. Um, so this, I, indeed, I think before moving to the classroom would be a good moment to, uh, to answer um, several more questions on, on the substance that I just discussed. Um, yep. So... We have one here um, about the EU. So I was wondering, um, do you approach the EU as an international organization per se in the book? The EU is often characterized as sui generis, or one could also argue the EU law has federal characteristics. Um, yeah, and I think that's a very important question. Um, and I think that's also a question um, that relates to the, the current crisis of, the, of global governance. Um, 
you know, is, is this current crisis also affecting the EU or is actually the EU an actor here that can, you know, still stand up for global governance, if, if you like. Um, in the book, we see the, uh, the EU very much um, as an international organization. So we treat it as an international organization, but we treat it as a very institutionalized organization, an institution that has very significant powers. So for instance, we discuss um, the role of the European Central Bank um, in setting inflation policy and dealing with the, with the euro crisis. Um, so it's an example where international organizations and their powers go, go really far. Um, and I think that that is nice to contrast that um, with a number of weaker international organizations, uh, even those that might be um, dealing with monetary um, and finance policy. Um, so for us, the EU is an international organization. So across the book, we really use a lot of examples of the EU um, as well as the United Nations. I think these are the two big international organizations um, that help us with a lot of the examples and explaining the, the type of logics and theories that, that we're pursuing. Um, but we treat it as an international organization in this book, yes. Okay, and one more. Um, can you single out any other articles or books on international organizations that you found important for the development of this scholarly field? Thing. Um, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question and that's also a nice bridge to, um, to essentially the next um, slide when we start talking about, um, about the book. Um, so there will be a number of quiz questions um, coming up um, and I think I can address that, that question in the context um, of those slides. I think that, that would be very nice. Um, but before giving you an answer to that, I, I have some quiz questions lined up. So maybe we can go to the first one. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, I'd like to teach international organizations and the question is in, in what context? Um, so I'd like to teach international organizations as part of a, a course on international relations 101, so first year undergraduate course um, that uh, would have a, have a large enrollment but would be rather elementary, um, or as part of a world politics course um, on for second and third year undergraduates. Um, so not just dealing with international organizations but also other forms of global governance, cooperation and so forth. Um, or are you really interested in teaching this as a standalone course on international organizations? All right, that's very encouraging. So the majority um, likes to teach a standalone course on international organizations. Um, it's good to see that um, the interest in international organizations and standalone courses um, very much is, is on the rise. Um, I also see that still quite a number of, um, of, of people in this, this webinar are interested in, um, in a more general world, world politics course and perhaps we can talk a little bit about um, that as well, um, but I think this is a nice result to, uh, to see. Um, we have another question for you lined up. Um, that's, um, what would your ideal course on international organizations look like? Um, and here we get to, towards the, the type of literature that you would assign. Um, in your ideal course, would you uh, just put on the, on the syllabus a coherent textbook that you read from cover to cover? Um, and then there might be some form of exam or paper, um, or would you want to have a coherent uh, course book complement with a number of journal articles? Um, would you prefer to simply select uh, a number of relevant chapters from, from a single or multiple books uh, complemented with journal articles, um, or is your ideal course just journal articles uh, and is a textbook perhaps something for background reading? Um, so if you could just answer this, I get a bit of a sense of, of the type of um, courses you're interested in teaching. Coherent textbook complemented by journal articles and chapters from single multiple um, books with journal articles. 
Um, okay, I think that's very very clear, um, and I think that also brings us to the to the next um, slide, um, which which is really about the the third edition of the, the book that we've um, written, because I think that's really how we see this this book um, um, at work um, as a coherent textbook with thirteen chapters. Um, you can essentially put every week uh, during a semester long a single chapter on the reading list, complement it with a number of journal articles, um, and it makes for a real nice coherent course. Um, it's about how international organizations actually work, it's about policy domains, it's about, about the institutions. Um, so I think that's really how we see this book, um, a coherent approach based around the political system, um, that works well for semester long course. Um, what we've also done, and some of you might know the book, um, there are recommendations uh, for additional reading. So I think that really brings me back to the, um, the question um, uh, of a couple of minutes back. Um, and we've really fought for this re revised um, book, not just about you know, the further reading type of categories, uh, but really, you know, what are nice journal articles, easily accessible journal articles that most of our libraries have access to, um, that that one can put on the syllabus in addition to um, one of the one of the chapters. Um, so I think that's uh, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I must also say that for the revised version, um, I've particularly paid close attention. Um, to the, the type of balances in the book. So in the previous version, for instance, the history chapter was rather long. I believe it was about 50 pages, um, where the decision chapter uh, on decision-making rules was, I think, only 11 pages um, or so. Um, so that's not an ideal balance if you want to use the, the textbook um, on a week-to-week -week basis. And I think we really focused on that, um, so that we have nice chapters um, that have more or less the same type of length um, that have a contained number of, of topics for, for discussion um, and indeed a number of suggested readings that one can use um, in addition to these, these chapters. Um, so the table of contents uh, is obviously available online um, and I'm, I'm sure that um, you, you can find it, uh, but we have a section on theory and history of international organizations. Um, those are two chapters, then we have four chapters on, on policy making of international organizations, um, and we have five chapters on the activities of international organizations across policy domains. Um, and once again, the, the idea is really about, you know, how do international organizations actually work? Um, so we're really interested in the functioning of international organizations, um, which also, I think, um, uh, the cover of the book hints to, um, which you see on the slide, um, the, the, the specific lines for which you know, cars drive on this intersection, um, the, the type of direction um, international organizations provide, um, how they translate inputs um, in, into outputs. Um, so I think that's really the, the core philosophy for um, our book. Um, I have on the next slide, if I can still have that, uh, that's that's the, the question slide. Um, so perhaps we could just go back one slide um, and see whether there are indeed um, still questions um, about this book or more uh, about international organizations in general? Uh, yes, so we've had a few more questions come in. Um, firstly, thank you very much for this session. I've enjoyed getting insights into the book. Do you think this trend of countries withdrawing from international organization financing is related to the current anti-globalism calls and conservative political movements? Can you elaborate on those two factors' impact on international organizations? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question um, to try to make sense of, of the withdrawal of states from international organizations. Um, and I, I think in general, um, you know, if you take a long historical perspective, uh, we shouldn't be too surprised um, that they, this is happening. Um, you know, international, uh, international organizations help solve, solve problems. We think that they can do better um, than, than other forms of governance, but they develop over time. At a certain moment, problems are solved. International organizations become less relevant um, for specific states. Um, so, so I think logically we would expect that um, countries at a certain point um, withdraw. 
Um, at the same time, um, you know, as we speak uh, in the British Parliament, they're thinking about, you know, no deal Brexit, um, no Brexit at all, uh, withdrawal agreements. Um, so I think on a day-to-day -day basis, we're we're really dealing um, with some of the difficult discussions around um, withdrawal, which also makes um, makes it seem as you know a bigger challenge to to global governance in um, in general. Um, I think one of the bits here um, as well, um, both in the case of Brexit um, and also in the case of of Donald Trump. Um, is that obviously a lot of the um, the arguments um, that are being made are not necessarily about the function of international organizations or let alone the perceived functioning um, of international organizations, uh, but also have to do with domestic politics and things that are very remote um, from international organizations. Um, and I think that's um, perhaps where, um, where your question also came in. Um, you know, is this about broader, broader movements um, that are not necessarily about whether an international organization does its job properly. Um, and I think that's, that's a question worth asking. Uh, and also the type of question one might have, you know, towards the end of class, uh, having read this book, um, you know, really returning to that question, you know, how, how deep does the crisis of the current liberal order run? Um, is this about a shakeup or, or is this something more? So thank you very much for that. Okay, and one more here. Um, when you talk about the crisis of international order, do you primarily consider the design of international organizations and their institutions as a cause for crisis? Or do you consider the underlying universal norms of said organizations and their role in the crisis of international order? Um, yeah, and I think that's that's really truly an excellent question um, to which I I don't have the answer. Um, that's actually a question that I'm I'm currently addressing in uh, in a different research um, project. So um, hopefully by the time that we publish the fourth edition of this book, um, there might be um, some answers. Um, the way I see it is that international organisations are constantly under all sorts of um, external pressures. Um, Political, uh, political actors change their inputs, their demands. Um, I think that's really part of part of politics, and I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, the real question for me is um, how uh, do international organizations respond to those type of external challenges? Um, and I think their institutional design um, is a large part of the story. Um, the ability for them to adapt, um, the flexibility built in into their designs, um, but also the degree of agency they have to resist, uh, the degree of agency they have to, to resist some of the external factors, um, I think is quite fundamental um, in, in how all of this um, plays out. Um, the question on you know, how this relates to international norms is an important one as well. Um, because to a large extent, some of these international norms develop indeed externally of international organizations. But we also know very well um, that international organizations, in particular staff of international organizations, uh, contributes to the establishment of those norms. And so it's mutually constitutive in that sense, to use a, to use a constructivist term, um, where it might not be too easy to separate um, exactly what, what goes out, uh, on outside international organization and what goes on inside international organizations. Um, yet I think these are all simply still theoretical spec speculations from, from my side. Uh, we, as I said, we are currently working um, on some empirical research in that field, but I think this is really, uh, for me, the critical question um, in the field of international organizations uh, for the years to come. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so, budget and membership strategy appear to be at stake. Does the book cover the change on membership and budgeting strategy as well as the cross participation towards agencies, i.e. UN Secretariat is a member of ITU or other agencies? Um, just trying to get that question um, right. Um, so we um, do spend quite a bit of time talking about the type of resources um, and the type of support um, that states offer for um, international organizations. Um, and I think we are here to discuss as well, um, you know, the, the, the type of assessed contribution, the, the contributions that member states have to make um, versus voluntary contributions um, and how they use other type of budgetary means 
um, to support international organizations. Um, what I think we pay less attention to um, in this book um, is how um, international organization A is supporting international organization um, B. We do notice the, um, the complexity um, and the overlap um, of international organizations. Um, but ultimately, we, we focus very much on, on international organizations in, in their own right um, as formal, um, largely state-driven um, organizations. So I'm not sure that entirely answers um, the question. Um, I think what is quite useful, certainly in our theoretical chapter, um, is that we have some very nice um, advances um, uh, on the theoretical level in the field of international organizations. Um, one of these things here is institutional design we're talking about, uh, but also practice theory um, and, and a number of other things, more power-based approaches in international organizations. So I think there are some key updates um, there. Um, I'm not sure this entirely answered the question, um, but, but I think that's the, uh, the key thing for our book, yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So. I'll just move on to our final screen here. Um, and I wanted to share our contact details so that if you do have any follow-up questions after the webinar, you can easily get in touch at our general email address. Um, we'll be able to follow up on any questions that you might have that we didn't get around to answering. Um, and you can also request a complimentary sample copy of the book at the following link. So you can have a closer look at the text to see if it's right for your course that you're running. Um, so I'll just wrap up, wrap up now by saying thanks very much for joining our webinar today. Um, thank you very much to Hayoke for his um, presentation. That was really interesting. Um, we'll make sure to share the recording with you so that you can watch it again and share it with any colleagues that might find it of interest. Um, so I hope you found it enjoyable and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, so have a lovely rest of the day and goodbye. <laughs>